Well, we can't forget surgery. You know, we still need it, and we need the, our skilled surgeons. Right, Dr. Lowry? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, Dr. Lowry does not need any introduction. He's our famous surgeon par excellence with interest in valve disease and, and many other surgical approaches. But uh, he's, he's one, I think, would be a world expert knowledgeable in mitral valves. And Gerald, great to have you. Oh, thank you very much, Bill. Right. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And pleasure to be here with you all. That's a, two great lead-ins for our little talk here. Well, I've changed the title slightly. Role of the gold standard valve surgeries versus transcatheter therapies. But very importantly, in 2018, this is an incredibly dynamic field. Now, when I refer to the gold standard, most of the major evolutions in cardiac surgery began in 1960 with aortic mitral uh, prostheses being implanted and mitral valve repairs beginning around that time also. So we've got six decades and millions of implants worldwide. And so we have a tremendous database to derive our recommendations for the use of these therapies in our patients. So we have generally predictable long-term outcomes. All pathologies in the heart are treatable. And uh, in keeping with Dr. Zogby's theme of uh, professional responsibility, these surgeries are a lot cheaper. So uh, I just want to let you know that. Uh, so basically, what are the indications for intervention? How has that been affected by the availability of these therapies? And what types of valve therapy should we be thinking about? Well, the uh, document that helps people like me who aren't uh, cardiologists but who are very interested uh, in this is the 2014 American Heart Association ACC guidelines updated in 2017. And these provide a very comprehensive written and uh, uh, algorithm approach to the uh, understanding of the pathology, the diagnosis, and the treatment of these conditions. And so when you're looking at and thinking about these patients, this is a very helpful thing to have. There's a 70-page executive summary that's very readable. And for those of you who are interested in valvular heart disease, I really commend this document to you if you're pursuing this at a higher level. So when we go to the indications for the selection of non-gold standard therapy, the, as you've heard from Dr. Barker and Dr. Little, these generally tend to be the patients at very high risk for conventional heart surgery because heart valve surgery apart from the fact there's some risk in some categories, is really pretty close to perfected in many respects. And as they mentioned, it's, there are either patient-related problems with the poor health and frailty or procedure-related problems where it's just too big a surgery, uh, multiple redos, uh, many different things to be fixed in the heart. And as we mentioned, the STS risk calculator is available online, and that's something that you can look at in your own office. Uh, now, we have a tremendous explosion, and Steve and uh, 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 Colin both have slides showing hundreds of these devices that are in development. They didn't show today, but there are numerous devices in the pipeline. And so in the next year or two, we may be talking about other options. But the currently approved devices, as was mentioned, is the uh, MitraClip and the two TAVA valves. They're the only ones with FDA approval. So when we look at aortic valve disease, the uh, TAVA is mentioned only for aortic stenosis. Uh, in the trials, the permanent pacemaker risk after these procedures is up to 30%. This is an ongoing problem. Uh, and uh, pacing long-term, as you know, has a risk of heart failure over time. Serious vascular complications, 10 to 15%. Still a problem with periprosthetic leak, definitely getting better, but still a significant problem. And the durability is still an issue. Uh, the 45 or 50 people who uh, reached the five or six year mark in the uh, trial in uh, Scandinavia uh, doesn't constitute a very big sample. And the 3% failure rate at that time is the best ever for any uh, bioprosthetic valves reported in any setting. Uh, stroke is similar in surgery and in uh, these interventions, but they uh, may be more diffuse and potentially more prone to start dementia in the uh, uh, TAVA patients. Now, all the TAVA trials, as we mentioned, are really only up to five-year follow-up. 
The FDA has approved the high risk uh, patients. Now this intermediate risk term is something that we really need to understand a little better. This doesn't mean that they're intermediate risk patients. Uh, low risk is, as you have heard, under trial at the moment. There is no long term data and there are going to be many unanswered questions before we proceed to lower risk. And it's also important to point out the average age of the patients in the Scandinavian low risk trial was 79 years. So it's not 50 and 60 year patients, it's 79 year olds. If we look at what are really the intermediate uh, term risk patients in the uh, first uh, uh, randomized trial for uh, TAVA in this category, we can see this is a very sick old group of people here very old, multiple comorbidities, half of them had frailty uh, characteristics. So these are really high risk patients. So it gets confusing when you start talking about high risk, intermediate risk, and now all of a sudden every 60 year old that walks into your office is gonna be low risk. That's not the story. They're still all in upper risk categories as far as uh, our, uh, our uh, classification. Now, a bioprosthetic valve durability is something we've been concerned with in surgery since the late 60s when these valves came into use. Uh, we've got 20 year follow-up for lots of patients uh, who've had these valves put in at the age of 60 and older. Less data in less than 60 year old patients. These valves have not done well generally in people under 60. It's definitely a problem to find out what true TAVA durability is because the mortality in these people uh, by design in these trials is in the 30 to 50% range by five years. These are the sickest of the sick who've come in for relief of their symptoms by TAVA. And it's been very effective and helpful in these people, but uh, finding out this data can be difficult. We do know that all our work trying to enhance the durability of uh, uh, surgical uh, bioprostheses over the years gives us a body of information about what enhances and what diminishes the durability of bioprostheses in the surgical setting. And many of those factors indicate that TAVA durability will be less. The TAVA valve is a lighter, more compressible version of the SAVA valve. This is some other uh, uh, data at five years. TAVA durability, 20% uh, in this uh, in this group of uh, 116 or so patients. So TAVA durability in some reports already, we're seeing 20% problems at five years. Now, uh, we're saying, well, we've got all these old people, what's it matter? Well, actually, the latest um, Social Security Administration data shows that an 80 a male in the United States has an average life expectancy of nine years, and a female at 80 has an average life expectancy of 10 years. So when we're putting prostheses into these elderly people, we can't assume that they're all going to be dead before five years or six years when the valve might start failing. We're going to have a bunch of people back in the clinic in their mid-80s looking for another operation or intervention. That's what we're going to have. <laughs> and these old people get tougher and tougher. <laughs> uh, now, we've heard about age, and it's easy to think, well, everyone who's 80 that walks into the office needs a, uh, needs a TAVA, but the fact of the matter is some of these old ranchers who were working really hard running their ranches, and then three months ago they had to stop bailing the hay. Uh, in our experience and our analyses, age alone is not a predictor of mortality, and you can see in a, my own series of 3,000 or so valve replacements, that age had very little impact right through the 80s and up into the 90s on uh, overall mortality, uh, perioperative mortality. Now, at the other end of things, as we start talking about going into younger and younger age groups, both the US and the uh, European guidelines recommend that uh, bioprosthetic valves not be used in people under 60. And there's good reason for this. We obviously, if people have their reasons and they really want a bioprosthesis, we ultimately will do what they want. But we recommend to them not to do it. This is the biggest series that has been published in these uh, people. And you can see by uh, 10 years, over 20% of the bioprostheses have failed in this group that had a mean age of 51. So moving on to the mitral valve. Uh, this is the uh, set of the algorithm for mitral regurgitation. I really echo uh, Dr. Little's comments regarding the mitral valve. The mitral valve is very insidious and complicated in terms of uh, people getting into trouble while asymptomatic. And so there's a lot of numerical data that we follow closely in these people. And I think it is well worthwhile that if you have a patient with uh, mitral regurgitation that you consider sending them on 
for at least a, a, a review by a cardiologist who can advise you and keep them under close observation because these people can really get away from us uh, because of their ventricle deteriorating in, a, in the asymptomatic state. Now, unlike the aortic valve, we've got a large variety of pathologies for the mitral valve to look at. We know that, uh, and it's confirmed in the uh, AHA guidelines, that mitral valve repair is now recognized as superior to uh, re uh, replacement in every possible setting. 1% mortality versus 5% uh, globally. Superior late survival by 20% at 10 years. That's 20% better survival at 10 years. Uh, superior durability to, re to replacement, uh, better hemodynamics, and a lower risk of endocarditis. This is the original repair, the late 1960s, rigid ring, chopped out pieces of leaflet. Problem is these have poor overall uh, ability of the surgeons to repair everybody, poor long-term durability, and they have some of this SAM you heard about, the anterior leaflet getting stuck up against the septum. In the United States, overall repair rate, 60%. So if you just pick a random hospital and send it in there, the surgeon will have done five mitral repairs per annum and his repair rate will be 60%. As was mentioned, the mitral valve very complex with this relationship with the other components of the heart. Anterior leaflet here in direct continuity with the aortic valve. And if we look here, here's the aorta rocking and rolling, coming down in systole, back up in diastole, and the mitral valve changing its shape and rocking and rolling also with the aortic mitral angle changing. So extremely dynamic as opposed to the aortic valve, you can shove something in, expand it, it'll be there. The mitral valve is changing dimensions and position all through the cardiac cycle. And here similarly with an MRI, you can see the left atrium here with the mitral valve, anterior leaflet here, posterior leaflet here, ventricular system. You can see the movement of the aortic valve, the ventricle, the atrium, and the mitral leaflets. So uh, the Carpentier technique, we believed, had poor results because it simply demolished all of these uh, motions that were so essential for the normal function of the mitral valve. So over the last 15 years, we've worked hard here at uh, Houston Methodist with Dr. Zogby and his colleagues and the University of Houston to develop a technique which restores rather than destroys normal dynamic function. Uh, we emphasized uh, the role of intraoperative simulation by inflating the heart to an end diastolic position that simulates the end of diastole before the onset of systole, flexible annuloplasty ring and no leaflet resection. And we use artificial cordy to uh, realign the leaflets. Over the last 10 years, we've accumulated a large number of publications by echo, cardiac MRI, and CTA, and strain analysis, which now shows almost normal restoration of function in these valves. And we now have a, a technique that gives us 100% repairability of the majority of pathologies and a 90 to 95% 10 year durability. Here's a big anterior leaflet, it's flail. You can see the ruptured cordy. We use our uh, artificial cordy. We're looking through the mitral orifice here straight down towards the apex. You can see we've got these cordy made out of Gore-Tex. We're gonna bring them up and put them through the anterior leaflet here. Cordy are now in place, we now adjust them we put a, a flexible ring, this moves with the annulus. When we make the annulus smaller, its flexibility comes back. Here you can see the end result. Everything's moving normally, and we've got a beautiful outflow tract, no evidence of SAM, and you can see the artificial cordy down here. Mitral stenosis, uh, we heard mention, and as we heard mentioned, the mitral valvuloplasty by balloon is a very effective therapy. This actually was the subject of a uh, a review in 1998 by Dr. Bono. And there at that time, six randomized studies. So there's no question in properly selected patients that mitral valvuloplasty for rheumatic mitral stenosis is the first line therapy. But it's very important to note that it works best in people who've been assessed uh, by ECHO and had a score, a four part score for all the different components. And generally the younger patients with lower scores are the ones that do the best with the balloon. If you get really old people and they got a lot of calcium and stuff, what's likely to happen is, as happened here, is you put the balloon, you blow it up, and instead of splitting up the commas, it goes straight up the middle of the anterior leaflet. Fortunately, we're usually able to get in there and repair these valves and split them open surgically afterwards. Now, as was already mentioned, MAC hasn't uh, been a very good uh, pathology because it's very difficult to deal with. 
Mac refers to this accumulation of calcium under the mitral leaflet and invading the top of the uh, uh, muscle of the ventricle related to repetitive stress on the leaflet. Here's the leaflet and the blood's coming up from below and there's a constant jerking on the muscle and eventually that gets inflamed and calcifies. And the calcium involves the muscle and also involves the leaflet to some extent. This is an extreme example here. Dr. Carpentier has classified it. Fortunately, most people have uh, mitralinear calcification with a degree that's surgically treatable. It doesn't invade the ventricle too much and it doesn't invade the leaflets too much. But in some people, it isn't an operable condition. Quantification by CT is a field that needs further work so we can find out exactly what we're operating on and exactly what uh, can be treated with uh, uh, mitral valve replacement. Uh, 25 to 30 percent uh, mortalities in these series attempting mitral valve replacement are not uncommon. So hokum, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we treat here quite a bit, uh, causes mitral valve uh, insufficiency. This can be corrected by resection of the hokum. Very rare to need to do anything to the mitral valve. Tricuspid valve, still no ideal therapies percutaneously. We still have to get in there and repair these valves surgically. So just briefly and in conclusion, 2,000 mitral valve repairs, 100% repairability now with our new techniques. Age again, no impact on outcome up into the 80s. 100% uh, 10 year freedom from reoperation, 95%. 91% uh, and 86% freedom for uh, significant MR on echo uh, in our studies. And because we don't resect the leaflets, if we go back in to re-repair, uh, we don't have to put prosthesis. So freedom from late prosthesis, 99%. So in conclusion, and this applies to 2018 only, <laughs> nothing much has changed. Our good risk people still need surgery. Our bad risk people, which we used to say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We've now got a great group of people. We can tell them we're going to send you to this other doctor, and he's going to make you almost back to normal. And so they get sent over to the valve clinic and we all have a big talk and many of them are actually helped by a clip or a, a prosthesis. So it's a very close teamwork. And with the enormous number of things coming down the pipeline, the next few years are gonna be extremely exciting. We're gonna see all sorts of devices. And the reason I got my son to go into orthopedics is because in five or 10 years, I don't think there's gonna be many prosthetic valves being put in surgically. Thank you. <laughs>